Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Atlantic Council. I'm Damon Wilson, Executive Vice President of the Council, and I couldn't be more delighted to welcome all of you here for our discussion this evening on the battle for Pakistan. Um, we are particularly delighted uh, this evening because we are joined not only by the premier expert on Pakistan here in the United States, but someone who is an incredible friend, an incredible partner, someone who's part of the Atlantic Council family, Shuja Nawaz. Welcome, Shuja. Um, Fred Kemp and I, I think everyone in this room knows Shuja for those following online. Uh, Shuja Nawaz is a distinguished fellow here at the Atlantic Council, but he's much more than that. Shuja was the founding director of the South Asia Center at the Atlantic Council. Uh, and in fact, Shuja joined Fred Kemp, our president and CEO, who is here with us this evening, um, at a critical moment to help create what became the first regional center of the Atlantic Council and to really set in motion a process that rejuvenated this institution and has produced what we have today. Shuja, you were here at the beginning of this uh, turnaround story as a partner in crime with Fred. Uh, we love having you in the family. We love having you back, um, especially because tonight we get to focus on his work. Um, you were launching this new book, The Battle for Pakistan, The Bitter U.S. Friendship in a Tough Neighborhood. Um, which is a testament to his extraordinary expertise of many years of tackling security issues here at the council, where he's had unparalleled access to security actors, both in Pakistan and the United States, something that's reflected richly in this, this fascinating book. If you haven't had a chance, please make sure to pick up uh, a copy after the discussion. Um, this book gets at the heart of the dynamic, of what is a dynamic, complex, and long history between Pakistan and the United States. Shuja has brilliantly laid out the fundamentals of the relationship between our countries and provides some remarkable insights and really deep analysis on this um, ever-evolving relationship as it relates to U.S. policymaking in South Asia. Um, I'm proud to say that it's because of Shuja's thought leadership in Washington and Islamabad on many of these issues and his efforts here at the Council that we have been able to build out the Council's deep and continuing body of work um, not only on South Asia and security issues with Pakistan in particular. That legacy lives on through our South Asia Center, um, now led by Irfan Norden. Irfan, we're delighted to have you on the team as the relatively new director of the South Asia Center with Fatima and Trevor who are here. Um, you're an intellectual force in your own right and really delighted to see, Shuja, what you built have borne fruit. Um, it's great to have you back here. We salute you for your decade-long work in this realm. You've been a great partner, a great friend, uh, and an inspiration for, for myself and many of the team members here at the Council. I'm also particularly pleased because I am a personal fan of our moderator tonight, uh, fantastic moderator Steve Inskeep from NPR. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Steve has the voice that everyone recognizes as the host of NPR's Morning Edition as well as NPR's Morning News podcast up first. Known for his interviews with presidents and congressional leaders, Steve has a passion for the stories of the less famous as well. And most notably for tonight, He's the author of, of Instant City, Life and Death of Karachi, a 2011 book on one of the world's great mega, mega cities. Steve, thank you. It's terrific having you with us this evening. These conversations that the South Asia Center is running are about how to help raise public awareness, but also our own understanding of the complex issues and to make the case that an adaptive and strong South Asia is critical to navigating an increasingly complex, chaotic world. Um, because of the investment that Shuja helped make in our work here at the Council, we're continuing that strategic bet on South Asia as a key part of our portfolio. Um, so before I turn it over to you, I do want to encourage all of you, both in this room, following online, to join the conversation uh, through the handle Atlantic Council, but also AC South Asia. Thank you all for being with us tonight on what's going to be, I think, a very interesting conversation. Let me welcome Shuja to the stage to offer some thoughts, and then Steve will join for a conversation about this remarkable book. Thank you. Thank you, Shuja. Thank you very much, Damon, and thank you, Fred, and Thank you, Irfan and Fatima and the, the South Asia team. Um, I, I should say also, as I do in the book, that I want to thank Fred Kemp for having brought me 
to the Atlantic Council. I didn't know anything about the Council. Harlan Oldman, who was in the audience, had introduced me to Arno de Beaugrave, who gave me my first assignment at, uh, in a think tank. Uh, and then uh, Harlan and Arno managed to bring me to the Atlantic Council, and we ended up working on a task force on Pakistan that led eventually to the idea that there should be a South Asia center. And uh, in 2008, between uh, Christmas and New Year's, Fred and I had a number of meetings where he finally made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And uh, we had the launch of the South Asia Center in January 2009. Um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background about the book because uh, I think I don't want to try and compress what I've covered in the book uh, in, in 400 plus pages uh, in, in five or 10 minutes. Uh, but th the background was that it began originally as an idea to update uh, my earlier book, Crossed Swords. Uh, the idea was to add a few chapters and bring that up to date. And um, when I started doing it, my first chapter was 200 pages. And so I said to Oxford, I said, this is not going to work. Uh, this is going to be unsatisfactory for everyone and especially for me. And so. Uh, I said, what I will do is give you a fresh essay to put at the front of Cross Swords, the new edition, and I'll update some segments of it so that you don't have to repaginate everything. And uh, then I'll give you a new book. And so we agreed. And so what I did essentially was I went back to all my stored reporter's notebooks uh, where I'd been taking notes and of my interviews and meetings uh, here as well as in the region as well as meetings that we had organized on, on a track two basis with people uh, from India and Pakistan and Afghanistan um, uh, in the region as well as outside the region in places like Dubai and Bangkok. And uh, I, I decided that I would use that and then go back to the people that I talked to and learned from and ask them if they would sit down for formal interviews and I was delighted when almost everybody, including many key uh, persons that are mentioned in the book and that I acknowledge with deep thanks, who are in the audience today, uh, actually sat down and spoke on the record. And so I have transcripts and uh, tape recordings. Uh, and the few that went on background, I could triangulate information around them. So that was kind of the process that I followed. And in the process, I, I managed to get into some documents that are not in the public domain as they should be, uh, but that from different sources I could see the documents and then knit together a story of who said what to whom with what effect, uh, which was what we were told to ask in journalism school uh, when you wrote a story. Um, and so we decided that we would do a first regional edition for a South Asian audience. and so. My agent, uh, Priya Doraswamy of Lotus Literary, uh, said, let's aim for South Asia first, and then we'll, we'll try the, the US and British markets. Uh, and uh, we were delighted when Milli Ashwarya of Penguin Random House said um, they wanted to do the book for South Asia. And not only that, but that we signed the contract in January, and they said they would get the book ready and out in the open by August. <coughs> And uh, for those of you that have published books, that's warp speed uh, in publishing. And I was excited um, to work on the book. We got it done, and, and so this is, this is the, the end result. And it's a good feeling to have it out so quickly. Uh, we are next looking for the US uh, publishers to, to agree on a, a deadline with us and, and the terms. Uh, what I've done essentially is cover the Obama administration from 2008, end of 2008, uh, up to uh, the end of the administration. And then I was planning to end it in 2016, but then something called Trump happened. And I couldn't step away from the story. And so I continued uh, the, the work on the book. And literally, the book ends with uh, coverage of events that took place in July this year with the visit of Prime Minister Imran Khan. Um, and so that is, uh, is really uh, uh, what uh, it covers. Um, I do want to give a very special shout out to some people. 
that read my very first rambling, huge uh, draft. Uh, uh, and uh, two of them are here. And I want to, to mention Shahid Yusuf, uh, my childhood friend uh, who's sitting at the back, um, uh, multiple author himself, <laughs> uh, and Riaz Muhammad Khan, uh, my other friend, uh, whom I met in 1972 in Beijing when he was learning Chinese. Um, and has gone on to be Foreign Secretary of Pakistan and the author of many books. Um, and the third person was Ishrat Hussain. The three of them actually took time to read uh, this rambling manuscript and give me very detailed comments and annotations. Uh, but in addition, uh, I have so many people to thank that if I just listed all of them and took their names, uh, we would spend the rest of the evening on that. And I would much rather have a conversation with Steve Inskeep um, uh, about the topic behind the book. But I'm, I'm uh, humbled and gratified by the comments that they gave, but also by the comments that were given when we finally had a reasonable manuscript to share with people for advanced reviews. Uh, and you'll see them in the book. These are people who are very busy but who took the time to read the manuscript and actually some of them within a week or 10 days read the book and gave comments. So that was really gratifying. Now, I do want to say anything that you do about Pakistan, um, you have to do with a certain uh, element of humility and modesty. Uh, there are too many people who will tell you they're an expert on Pakistan. And when they tell you that, uh, make sure you've got your wallet in your back pocket. Um, because uh, I don't think I've met an expert on Pakistan yet. There are many that know a lot, and I don't think I belong in that category, but we're all attempting, like the blind man and the elephant, to put our hands on this animal and then say what, what it is. Uh, and so modesty and humility, I think, is very critical. And I say that particularly as an American now, because I began the book as a Pakistani, ended up as an American, when I finished it, I say it as an American that, you know, in America we need to be much more humble and modest about how we view the world and our ability to make changes in other people's lives and countries because more often than not, we end up destroying lives and countries. And, and we still don't know that, you know, we are being characterized as a kind of global Gulliver, uh, you know, traipsing across the globe, taking huge steps in and not being able to connect with the people. So just a few quick points, and then I, uh, I, I, I will ask Steve to join us for the conversation. Afghanistan was a key factor in this period as bringing the US and Pakistan together. After a serious break, and after uh, the military ruler of Pakistan, General Musharraf, had been ostracized. And so, um, what was guiding both countries was pure self-interest. It was a pure transactional relationship. And when I look back on, on this period uh, that we all grew up with and, and dealt with people, uh, it was truly the best definition of the French word that we adopted into the English language and that George Bernard Shaw used for his play. It was a misalliance. It was a marriage between unequal partners. And all the difficulties of an unequal marriage are the ones that were evident in this relationship. Afghanistan, uh, which candidate Obama was calling the necessary war, became soon the forgotten war and then the forever war. Uh, as we've shifted our focus to Iraq and then back to Afghanistan and then we kept changing the goalposts. Uh, in my book, I have a table which tells the whole story in, in just one page. Uh, it's called One War, 18 Years, 19 Commanders. The average tenure of our commander in Afghanistan was 13 months. The longest serving commander was the previous one, Mick Nicholson, who was there for two and a half years. And every commander, you just have to go back and look at their first pronouncement. They would all say, we are turning the corner. We, we turned so many corners that we did many circles uh, in Afghanistan. And all uh, at a huge cost to the American people, but to the Afghanist uh, people of Afghanistan and Pakistan also. 
thousands of people were killed in the, the wars that emerged. And as one of uh, the generals that I interviewed, Stan McChrystal, uh, was on the record, uh, we were fighting 10 different wars at one time. And uh, he was trying to see if we could corral this effort into, into one that was focused and that would, uh, that would work. The other point worth making is that there was a lack of a center of gravity for decision making in Washington. And it was matched by a lack of center of gravity of decision making in Pakistan. In Pakistan, it was a little simpler. It was the civil versus the military. When you talk to the civil, they would say we're on the same page as the military. You talk to the military, they would say we're on the same page as the civil. And as I said in one of my reports on fighting counter -ter uh, counter countering terrorism and militancy, even if they were on the same page, they were on different books. Uh, it was quite clear that there, there was no meeting of minds. Uh, and in the US, uh, state didn't know what CIA was doing at any particular time. DOD was fighting its own battles and making its own relationships. And in the process, the American people and the Pakistani people were forgotten. And uh, they were lost in this. Uh, the, the government of Pakistan repeatedly lied to itself and to the people of Pakistan and paid the price for, for that mistrust, which they had of their own people, because that was reflected in how they were viewed by America and the Western allies. Uh, so there was constant mistrust. Uh, and I think that was, uh, it was exaggerated once uh, Mr. Trump came into power, because then all the decisions here were not being made by the various actors in and around Washington, uh, but they were being made uh, as a result of 3 AM tweets out of the White House. The third point I wanted to, hi uh, to highlight was that there was a dehyphenation of India and Pakistan that occurred when uh, Ambassador Holbrook was appointed special envoy. And that, in some ways, was a good thing because suddenly the focus was not on India versus Pakistan. Suddenly the focus was India is a separate entity, Pakistan is a separate entity. But as Bruce Rydell said to me, uh, in one of the interviews, he said the U.S. didn't have a Pakistan policy. It, was, it started off wrong with AFPAC. It should have been PACAF. But there was no Pakistan policy. The only U.S. policy on Pakistan was a man named Musharraf. And when he fell, then there was scrambling around to look for who would, uh, who would take his place. And, and that n never worked. Uh, the fourth point is that U.S. aid doesn't work if you are using it transactionally to achieve certain immediate, e immediate effects. USAID works when you provide benefits that the people of the country see and that are long term. And in Pakistan, there are ample examples of that where USAID has worked. The building up of the intellectual capacity of the planning commission, for instance, uh, where in both India and Pakistan, advisory groups from Harvard and Ford Foundation helped set up this group that ended up running the economies of, of the two countries. Uh, you have the Lahore University of Management Sciences. You have the rejuvenation of the Foreman Christian College uh, and, and the big dams that were built that gave Pakistan the infrastructure that they needed, as well as, we shouldn't forget, the uh, Nilor uh, nuclear uh, test uh, reactor that allowed people to learn about nuclear energy and nuclear power. So now, where do we stand? Pakistan is facing an enormous domestic challenge. It is tied to militancy and regional terrorism and unrest. And in the past, the state had sponsored some of these elements for regional purposes or for domestic political gains. Uh, there is some hope if one is to believe the current army chief, that the monopoly of power must rest with the state. But we still have to see the results before we know whether there will be a serious effort to uh, de-weaponize and de-radicalize those elements that are making the, the state fragile. And, and finally, I think there's going to be a resolution of this battle for Pakistan, which is a battle for the soul and the future of Pakistan, uh, a battle between the centripetal forces that w can hold the country together 
and the centrifugal forces that will tear it apart if you don't pay attention to the periphery and to their needs, and you don't recognize that pluralism is a strength, it's not a weakness. Uh, these are some of the issues that the current government will face, uh, and particularly under the burden of a criticism that it has been captured by the military. And I think they have to prove that uh, a democracy can function within the country, and that will bring the country together and be able to live in a neighborhood that it wants to live in, rather than a neighborhood in which it wants to fight with everyone or everyone wants to fight with, with Pakistan. The economy will be the key in all of this, and what we're going to see in the next year or two is really going to set the tone for which way uh, Pakistan is going to decide uh, it's going to move. I end my book with this, and I will end my talk with this. Uh, the famous American sage Yogi Berra used to give directions to his home, and he would say, when you come to the fork in the road, take it. Uh, that was an actual description, and there was a good reason for it. But in the case of Pakistan, I hope Pakistan doesn't take that fork in the road. Thank you very much. Everybody. It's an honor to be here, and thanks for that talk, Shuja. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to mention, uh, take my privilege of being here to mention two things. First, this is a really absorbing read that is really clearly, deeply, deeply reported. Uh, there are signs of the interviews that you've done, the research you've done, all the way through this. Uh, I also want to mention, uh, <clears throat> I'm not an expert, I'm, a, I'm an observer. Uh, if I've learned to do anything well, it's listen. And this is one of the guys that I've listened to over the years, and I'm grateful for your assistance and your advice more than once. I really appreciate that. Uh, I do want to uh, comment on a few things that you just said, and then we'll dive in uh, to questions. First, you said that you didn't want to try to summarize your book in five to 10 minutes. Uh, that is correct. You shouldn't try to do that in five to 10 minutes. It's 2019. You need to summarize it in a tweet. <laughs> and the tweet needs to include the word loser which is five characters, so you have 235 additional characters that you can use at some point. You also use these unfamiliar words that I'd like to just get a little more into the public discourse. Humility and modesty. I very rarely hear those concepts with some of the people that I interview, uh, but uh, I do appreciate your approach and your, your efforts there, and congratulations on this, uh, on this book. Uh, it's a complex subject about which I propose to ask really quite simple questions. And we'll see if we can get to the essence of things and then invite some of your questions. Um, here's the first question that's on my mind. Are civilians in charge of Pakistan? No. That's a very simple and direct answer. Uh, I think uh, they would like to be. And successive governments have said that they're aiming for civilian supremacy. But uh, what would have strengthened their hold on government, which is governance, and good governance, was never really high on the agenda. Uh, and for good reason, uh, in, in many cases, Pakistan faced enormous domestic and external challenges. It's because of its geography it, and its strategic location, for one, and because of the enormous population growth. You have a country which is predominantly uh, youthful with a median age of 23. Mm. So 213 million, half of them are below the age of 23. And you haven't spent the money that you should have to educate them and to provide them with good health, which would improve their brains and their ability to contribute. Are you saying that if there had been a prime minister, if there had been a government 10 years ago or 30 years ago that had governed uh, in a way that was seen as effective, they would have had the power, the credibility, to give orders to the military rather than the reverse. Rather than seeing it as a power struggle, I think they would have been in a stronger position. Uh, and there was actually some work done by um, Parvez Hassan, uh, who was a retired World Bank economist, who took some numbers, went back into the 60s, and said, what if Pakistan had changed the mix of its its investments from defense to towards education and health, 
he came to the conclusion, uh, and this was done about five, six years ago, he came to the conclusion that the economic pie would be so big that Pakistan's defense budget would have been twice its current size. So the security aspect, which is one that drives Pakistani thinking uh, because of its neighborhood and fear of India, uh, it would have been more than covered. Had they cut in the past, they could grow now, is yes. what you're saying. Um, you have a quote in the book. Uh, you're, it's referring to General Kiani, one of the past uh, uh, chiefs of uh, chiefs of staff, Army chiefs of staff. I believe the quote is from Doug Lute, who's a retired uh, U.S. Uh, Army officer uh, and, a, and a really interesting thinker. He said that he wanted to work with General Kiani, but did not want to make him quote a de facto head of state. Is the current chief of Army staff the de facto head of state? I think there's been a shift in the way the military has approached this. Uh, they've become much more sophisticated. So during General Kiani's period, there were often reports of a so-called so soft coup taking place, and the military didn't like that. Uh, I think uh, there are those that now believe that the military may well have captured the civilian government. Uh, it's too early to, to say if that has actually happened because uh, the country is still going through economic turmoil. And uh, once it settles down and decisions are made, then I think it will be critical for the civilians to show that they're in, in charge. Uh, so I think at up to that point, uh, they will continue to talk about being on the same page. But there are some instances that are worrying. For instance, just this week, uh, there was a decision made, and nobody knows by whom, to withdraw the treason case against General Parvez Musharraf under Article 6 of the Constitution, um, which uh, is a treasonable offense and for which he should have been charged. This was never even brought up by the previous government of Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. They charged him for illegally removing the Chief Justice. Uh, and so it's when you hold fire uh, that you, you're really not exposing the country to what it needs to expose itself to, which is uh, a questioning of what happened and why it happened, and then everybody should know. I believe, as people have said, that sunshine is the best disinfectant. And in the case of Pakistan, that's very critical. Does Prime Minister Imran Khan, who, as you note, was here in uh, July, does he simply agree with the military's priorities? Does he suggest to them what to do? Do they quietly suggest to him what to do? Is he ignored? Do you feel you understand that power dynamic? It's too early to, to know exactly where uh, that power dynamic is headed, uh, but they do talk to each other and they seem to have uh, a warm relationship. Uh, Someday you'll do me a favor. Is it like that? Uh, it, it, <laughs> It, that's the unsaid part. Okay, uh, I right. think it's, it's critical to understand that uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan came into power uh, with uh, a government that uh, doesn't control the Senate. So he really can't make any changes in law. He's relying a lot on ordinances, which are like executive orders, uh, that you know, he issues those. And uh, they have to be presented to Parliament. Uh, there is a role for Parliament which it hasn't adequately filled in the past. And I think now is an opportunity for them, if they want to talk of democracy, that they want to walk the democracy talk, uh, for them to stand up and say, yes, uh, we need to talk about all of these things. And they've started Them being the who? The military parliament, and the parliament. The parliament, okay. Parliament. Because they are, after all, the elected representatives of the people. And... Um, Prime Minister Imran Khan has actually ceded extra space by bringing the army chief into the Economic Council. Uh, of course, the military has a very powerful business interest in the country, uh, but it is also in the interest of the military that the economy remains on an even keel, because if it goes south, then the military budget will go south too. Or if it continues to stay high relative to other needs of the people, there'll be unrest. You use the word misalliance to describe the relationship between the U.S. and Pakistan. Uh, if we look at the present moment, the present priorities, are the United States and Pakistan still allies? They're still in a misalliance. They say they're allies, 
uh, but at the moment it's only for Afghanistan and a quick exit from there. I don't see any other longer term thinking in Washington. I wish there was because there are ample opportunities and I have a whole chapter in my book called Choices which lists all the things that they can pick and choose. We in, don't make those in America. In Pakistan. Anymore. No, no, go as on. As well as in, yeah. no, no. in the go United on, go States. On. Joking. Yes. What, what's a choice? What's a choice that could be made that's not being made? Well, one choice is to, to invest in Pakistan's economy and build its capacity and, uh, and say to them, we are, we are here for the long run, but do it with modesty and humility. Just to give you an idea, we were so glad that we had $7.5 billion over five years that we had agreed to give to Pakistan under the Kerry Luger Berman Bill. We thought this was manna from heaven, the Pakistanis would do backward somersaults. But you know, in 2018, we had $24 billion of remittances from hardworking Pakistanis from around the world hmm. to the country in one year. Meaning that the United States is not investing in the way that it and, could. And it doesn't have that leverage. It needs to have the moral authority and it needs to be able to work on a regional basis. Uh, and I believe that you know, the best way of, of countering if you're worried about China's preeminence in the region is, is to do what I suggest is the creation of a new Grand Trunk Road alliance. And you know what the Grand Trunk Road is. It goes from Kabul through Pakistan and India to Dhaka. Uh, if you knit these countries together and bring Iran into the, the picture, you've got the center of gravity of the global economy in terms of population and markets. A real and counterweight to China, you think? Absolutely. You have a middle class in India of 300 million people. You have a middle class in Pakistan of 50 million people average per capita income on a PPP basis uh, uh, of um, $10,000 a year. Uh, if you work with them, if you empower them, uh, rather than choose your favorite SOB uh, who is running the country at any particular time for short term I'm sorry, games. is that a military acronym? Does anyone yes. know that? No, no, go on, go on. I'm yes. sorry. No, I'm sorry. I keep interrupting yeah, These you are on. historical references that I'm yeah. sure people will look up. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so you have this vision uh, of, of countries that could be united and could be united with the United States uh, in a productive way. But as you know, the route that is being developed is from China through Pakistan uh, to Gwadar, uh, rail lines, pipelines, and so forth. Has China become a more valuable friend or ally or whatever the proper word is to Pakistan than the United States? For the moment, yes because they've been consistent, and when they disagree with Pakistan, they do so quietly. Uh, they don't go on the ramparts and yell abuse at Pakistan. Uh, and as I said earlier, because cons consistently successive governments in Pakistan have lied to their own people, they've turned their own people against <coughs> America. Uh, we had the famous Pew polls, the annual polls that occur. And uh, one of the, the questions in that dealt with you know, who is the biggest enemy that Pakistan faces? And the U.S. was always number one. It was somewhere in the 60 percent percentile range. But there was another question in all the Pew polls which had an answer, but that was never highlighted. And that question was, do you want improved relations with the United States? 69 percent of Pakistanis polled said they wanted better relations with the United States. Hmm. These are ordinary Pakistanis, not their government in spite of all the propaganda that the government told them about drone attacks and this and that and conspiracies, uh, you know, U.S. Indian conspiracy, U.S. Israeli Indian conspiracy, Israeli Indian conspiracy. Uh, they were, you know, it, Pakistan remains a petri dish for conspiracy theories. Because you talk about the loss of trust, the, 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 the loss of trust in Pakistan's government, let me ask about another question of trust. Do Pakistani leaders trust the United States to keep its word, particularly given the way the U.S. has recently abandoned allies in Syria? Not in the, last, uh, the experience of the last couple of years. I think this is going to require a great deal of work on the part of, of the very hardworking U.S. diplomats 
and military leaders who want stability in the region uh, to rebuild that trust. I think that, that will take some time to rebuild. If you're a Pakistani strategic thinker, do you have to make some kind of contingency plan for the United States pulling out of Af Afghanistan at any moment or increasing its presence in Afghanistan at any moment, just making a very sudden change? I don't think the U.S. will increase its presence in Afghanistan. Right. I can say that very firmly and, and clearly. I don't think there's any stomach for that in the U.S. electorate or uh, on the Hill. Uh, but uh, pulling out, I think the Pakistanis have already gamed this. And they've, they've been gaming this for, for many years, uh, which is why you had to have this behavior where they continue to remain um, in touch with the Taliban. They may not control them, but they know that they, they are in the border region uh, that abuts Pakistan, the marcher regions of, of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, what used to be the no Northwest Frontier Province. Uh, but the other thing that I, the point that I make is that I don't think Pakistan should make a choice between the United States and China. It doesn't make sense for Pakistan unless it can remove itself from that geography. It, it shouldn't be making that choice. But every now and then you see Pakistani politicians stand up and say, you know, we only have one friend and that's China. I think the Chinese are going to get tired of that because they have their own regional and global interests. And it's very critical that Pakistan should be at friends with itself. And it's very critical that the government of Pakistan at any point and the military of Pakistan should trust its own people above everyone else and not make deals behind the backs of the Pakistani people. Uh, there shouldn't be this kind of patronizing attitude uh, which has characterized autocrats and dictatorships in Pakistan's history, that we know what the people want. Uh, Ayub Khan, the first military ruler, said he knew the genius of the people. He was using the word genius in a very loose way huh. uh, because he, he had written a plan. He knew it so well he didn't want to ask them actually yeah, what. exactly. And one of his, his uh, political advisors actually said that you should do what the Greeks did, uh, get approval by acclamation. So go to have a public meeting and uh, as President Trump does, you know, he says, do you want this? And they all say yes. So he says, Everyone wants it. So he actually suggested that Ayub Khan uh, use that method to get approval for his policies. The way, of course, that you would have an informed and engaged public is partly through the media. What has happened to the media in Pakistan, where, as you know, uh, 10 years ago, there was a remarkable uh, explosion of media? There still is an explosion of media outlets, but their ability to function has been destroyed by the business interests that run the media on, on the one hand, as well as the ability uh, of the, particularly the military, into services public relations to influence them, not directly, but through the organizations like the Pakistan Electronic Media Regulatory Agency. Uh, that is actually now determining who will appear on TV, including retired uh, military officers. So there is now uh, a, a list, a positive list. These are the people that have been cleared and that can speak on television programs. Uh, everyone else cannot speak. Uh, that is not very helpful. I think if you want to hear what people are saying, and if you want to be informed by that, and then make decisions that will be reflected uh, with support from the people. A few years ago, it was said that you could write things for the elite in English that would get you arrested if you wrote them in Urdu. Is that still true, that at least the elites can have a free discussion in English? No longer. There was a cynical view that you know 5,000 readers of Dawn, or the News, or the Nation, or one of the other English language papers. I remember I used to write for a magazine called Outlook which was uh, considered uh, progressive and leftist at one time during uh, the period of uh, Ayub Khan as well as uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. Uh, and um, Bhutto shut them down essentially by uh, not giving them uh, newsprint at subsidized rates, which everyone was uh, allegedly uh, applicable for. And the editor, I.H. Burney, uh, said to me, I've decided I'm just going to shut this thing down. 
because Bhutto in his press conferences used to tell people, look, we have a free press. You just read Outlook every week and you'll see what they say about me. And Bernie said, I'm not playing this game. And for he shut down the paper. He, and I used to report from him, for him from New York. And he said, we won't be doing anything for the next few weeks or months. Mm. And then he said, I've decided I'm not going to reopen the paper. I'll go back to my advertising agency. Uh, Bhutto sent people to beg him to reopen the paper because he needed it. He, he needed it as a fig leaf. Uh, I don't think that should be the approach of government. I think the more voices that emerge, if you can counter r misinformation with facts, then that's the best way of doing it. Does the army not even need the fig leaf anymore? I think there are some people there, and I don't know if this is a, a, a unified view, but there are some people um, that deal with public opinion who feel that they somehow have to protect the leadership. And in order to protect the leadership, it means they d shouldn't get any bad news. And this has never worked, and it never will. Uh, so it's, it's for people like me and others within the country to stand up and say, you need to hear this, even if you don't agree with it. Uh, I am thinking of the moment in Egypt when the elected President Mohamed Morsi was overturned by the military, <coughs> uh, thrown out by the military. And this was thought to be a kind of elite coup that the Egyptian elites, including many who we would consider to be pro-Western or open to outside ideas, that they favored it, that they had turned against democracy because it was not working out the way they wanted. When you talk about the military soft coup, the military expanding its already very large power within Pakistan, do you believe this is something that Pakistan's civilian elites prefer? Some of them, because there are old alliances there are alliances between the bureaucracy and the military, uh, between the bureaucracy and politicians, between the bureaucracy and business houses. Uh, and, and some of these get together as cartels, uh, and they benefit uh, from having a captive government that will give them special privileges so that they can uh, create essentially what's become uh, a rent-seeking economy. Everybody lives off those rents. Mm. Um, you were talking of Egypt. Uh, I'm reminded, and again, humility and modesty are very critical. Um, my colleague, then colleague at the Middle East in center of the Atlantic Council, Michelle Dunn, and I wrote a piece for the New York Times warning against the creation of a Pakistan on the Nile by supporting Morsi. And nobody listened to us. And now I think I would warn against the creation of an Egypt on the Indus. Hmm. I don't think people are listening to that either. Is democracy necessary in Pakistan? It is necessary anywhere, because that's what allows people to make decisions that affect them. I'm with you, but as you know, there are a lot of people who are questioning that at the moment. It's a messy process, and people like to have clarity, but you know, this is what people like Hitler also offered. And we just have to read history. Unfortunately, a lot of people are not reading history. Two more quick questions, and then I'm going to open it up for your questions. And I appreciate your patience uh, with my questions. I've enjoyed listening to the answers. Um, as best you can determine, what is it that President Trump wants from the US relationship with Pakistan? At the moment, it's something very narrow, which is a, a quick and clean exit out of Afghanistan. And, and to forget that Afghanistan exists. I don't know if you remember, but you know, we were taught way back uh, in the olden days when I was at journalism school that there was a term called Afghanistanism. And Afghanistanism, I was told, was, was an idea that was extremely vague and, and hidden that nobody really knew what it meant. Well, it's no longer that meaning now. Afghanistan is now a symptom of what ails uh, the US foreign policy machinery and regional politics. Uh, and it's very much at the heart of a very critical region of the world. Uh, it's a crossroads. Uh, so uh, I think for the US to disengage, uh, which is what will happen uh, if he succeeds, uh, is going to be devastating, not just for the United States, but also for the countries in the region. 
just to underline that, if that's a symptom, if Afghanistan is a symptom, what's the diagnosis? Well, the diagnosis has been made by people that are much smarter than I am. Uh, and it means that you really have to have a much more open approach and a regional approach to foreign policy. But you can't reach a solution in Afghanistan without talking to the Iranians. Hmm. And you know we're not doing that. You can't, uh, in the longer run, have a stable Afghanistan without having Pakistan and India agree on what a stable Afghanistan means. And what, uh, the converse question, what does Pakistan's leadership want from the United States above all? Pakistan's United States wants a consistent relationship with the United States. You know, the Pakistan government wants the U.S. to say what it would like from Pakistan and to stick with it and to respond with assistance in creating the enabling environment that will allow Pakistan to make changes internally. Pakistan's biggest battle at the moment is not external, it is internal. It's fighting militancy and terrorism and lack of education and bringing wi more women into the workplace. If Pakistan could bring, uh, uh, forget the exact numbers, but if it bring all the women that uh, it could into the workplace, uh, it, it would increase its GDP by 22 mm. percent. This is one figure that I saw somewhere. Uh, but regardless, the point is that uh, the economic and political future of Pakistan lies less in distant overseas alliances and more in what Pakistan does for itself. And there are very smart, hardworking people in Pakistan who've gone outside the country's borders and done extremely well in the Middle East, in Britain, in Canada, US, Australia, uh, even Japan. Um, that's the kind of person that you want to retain within the country and give them the opportunity to, to make something happen. And I think it can be done. But my, my friend Arnold de Burgrab used to tell me that, you know, I was a congenital optimist. And, and he would always remind me that a pessimist is an optimist with experience. <laughs> So I'm always reminded of that. Ah. Well, thank you for your insights. I have many more questions, but I will table them for the moment and invite your questions. Uh, is there a microphone that's going to go around? Is that how this is going to work? Let me, let's go with this woman right here who's, uh, at, who's standing up. Yes, yes ma'am. The microphone will come to you. Uh, when I call on you, if you would not mind simply saying your uh, name uh, so that we get to know each other slightly, and if you can just ask, you know, let's, let's keep asking like direct questions so we hear the wisdom of this man. I ask the worker, so I can understand your feeling, your frustration, but because I lived in Karachi 18 years, my husband, he was deputy governor of the state and the Pakistan. We were captive here three years, and we escaped from there. So I can feel your frustration, your thinking, and you have written this book. This is all through the political you're asking about is the book political analysis it's economic military and political all of these okay let's go right on who else has a question um, let's go way in the back I'll get to you sir but I see a hand I can't see the body attached to the hand but it's right over there <laughs> yes the person waving the hand yes please stand up um, go, go for the microphone first and go ahead and say your name um, hi everyone, my name is Rana Meher and I'm a student of politics from Qaeda Azmi University and I'm here for an exchange program with the State Department and uh, so my question is directed to Shuja. Of course, U.S. relations, is, Pakistan U.S. relations are predominantly uh, dependent upon security and while we see that people-to-people -people interaction is very important, how do you think that shift can come so that the focus on security can shift to more uh, progressive relationships? Uh, I think I hinted at that uh, in the fact that the key element in Pakistan will be the economy. Uh, once you straighten out the economy, there will be opportunities uh, not just for the U.S. government but for private investment also to occur. Um, and I think one that's, once that starts happening uh, and you have much more traffic between the U.S. and Pakistan, then this relationship will open up, but much more important I think is, is in the regional context. We haven't mentioned Kashmir. 
Uh, that remains an issue, and India and Pakistan need to find a way to reopen that relationship because that's an economic relationship that crosses from India through Pakistan into Afghanistan and Central Asia and connects Iran through Pakistan with India. I think the economy will really be the critical uh, factor in determining where things go. I want to follow up on the key quest the key word I think in your question was how how can this happen you made a case in the earlier talk for what I guess we could call enlightened self-interest on the part of the military that if they loosened their grip on the economy somewhat that there might be so much growth the military would end up with more money rather than less um, how do you think that case can be made and sustained? Do you need one charismatic chief of army staff? Do you need a cultural change throughout the military? Is it possible at all? What do you think? Well, the military is a top-down institution, so the army chief uh, really affects how things are done. And we have now, for the second time in recent memory, an army chief who has received an extension. So he will actually have six years uh, by the time he, he finishes. Um, to effect change. Uh, I think he has a great opportunity to make that kind of a difference. Uh, you also have an army chief who is reported uh, uh, to be a reader. So um, he, he actually tries to seek out information. And I think that the points that we are making, um, I, 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 a copy of the book is in his hands. Oh, good. And I hope he's reading it because uh, there are very specific things that can be done. Uh, that will improve the financial management within the military so that they get a bigger bang for the buck uh, and also reshape the militaries as a military institution which has not been done in Pakistan. The kind of lip service has been paid to reorganizing the commands and so on. Um, and Pakistan, it's now 72 years and Pakistan hasn't effectively moved out of the Second World War mindset mm. in managing its defense. Um, the other thing is the military has powerful economic interests uh, which don't make economic sense because there's a lot of import substitution in its industries. And th they should learn from the Turks who decided that they would end the import substitution and actually buy things from abroad which makes sense when they're cheaper. And when you're not bound by that relationship, you're, you're not a prisoner of that relationship and it, it, it can be cut off, which was the case when we uh, in Pakistan were bound by the US aid relationship. So there are so many things that can be done internally, uh, but keeping in mind also what Ambassador Marker once said that the defense budget of Pakistan is, is, uh, is written in New Delhi. Uh, and, and that's a reality that you have to adjust to because you will never be able to match India. Uh, the Indian economy is much bigger. It's growing at a faster click. Pakistan's economy is now below 3% growth rate this year. The Indian economy is still around 6%, uh, lower than the ideal rate. Uh, but these are issues that uh, you have to address. And then you have to decide whether you're going to occupy this big economic space and crowd out the private sector in Pakistan, or whether you will allow the private sector to move into those industries uh, that you may have given birth to in Pakistan. You've, you've got foreign contracts and partners, uh, and then maybe they can take it and grow and make them multilateral uh, corporations. A gentleman in the front here has been very patiently waiting. Uh, if you'll bring the microphone up here, and then we'll go right to this woman and this, this gentleman back there. Go right ahead, please. Say your Thanks name. My Bill Courier, former partner at White and Case. Um, uh, Imran Khan made statements recently uh, aligning Pakistan with the actions of Erdogan. And uh, I'm curious whether you think that decision uh, and the decision to make that statement was a civilian decision, a military decision, coordinated decision, uh, whether they, however that decision was made, whether there was a view that it was aligned with Trump, because you really can't call it the U.S. government, but with Trump. Uh, and however that may be viewed, what is the advantage to the Pakistani people from that position? The Pakistan-Turkish relationship is, is rooted in history. 
And it's not just Imran Khan. Successive governments in Pakistan have had a very strong relationship with Turkey. There's a very powerful relationship between the people of Turkey and the people of Pakistan. If you exclude the governments entirely. Um, so that, that is at, at the, the heart of a lot of what goes on between these two countries. Uh, the decision was most definitely coordinated with the military because the military has had powerful relationships with the Turkish military going back into the 50s. In fact, before the US assistance to Pakistan began, uh, the Pakistanis learned from the Turks on how to deal with America. And the interesting catalyst in that was an American ambassador named Avra Warren, uh, who actually ran kind of workshops for the Pakistani military on how to talk to the Americans. Uh, it's all there in my earlier book um, and, the, and uh, in some of the other uh, books that have been written on this relationship. Uh, so th this, this is an old relationship. Imran Khan has added a new wrinkle to it. He's now trying to create a new coalition among Muslim leaders. So he's got a relationship with Mahathir Mohammed in Malaysia. He's got uh, Erdogan uh, in Turkey. Uh, and he's even gone to the OIC and, and trying to, to give them uh, a, a essentially a lecture on the need for the Muslim Ummah to get together. Uh, I don't know if it will work because there are too many local and regional interests that will conflict with this. But uh, the, the Turkish relationship uh, is one that I think uh, will remain and will be a factor. Woman in the second row here, please go right ahead. Yeah, that's you, Neil. Yeah, in the yellow. Hi. Wait for the microphone if you don't mind. That way the folks watching at home can hear your question. Good evening. My name is Momina Ijazi, and I work uh, at the IFC, the private sector part of the World Bank Group. And uh, Shuja, you had actually alluded to this in terms of the inequality and in some of the gender statistics. And increasingly, there is inequality in Pakistan. And I'd be just be curious, because you stand at this very interesting intersection between security, economy, military. Like, what is the current thinking? Because it seems fairly obvious that one does need to spend much more on education on uh, bringing women into the workspace, on equality, because that essentially becomes an issue of security and development for the country. What is the current thinking on that? Momina, you raise a very interesting question. Um, since I spent a lot of time between 2008 and now traveling inside the country, and particularly inside the training institutions of the military, one of the things I noticed was that inside the military, there's been a, an enormous shift at hiring women, particularly into the technical areas, and in, and in the Air Force, in combat roles also. Uh, and so when I went, when Rahil Sharif was the commandant of the military academy, and I spent time at the academy looking at their curriculum and training uh, systems, uh, he arranged a dinner, and he's, uh, I said, I'd really like to talk to the cadets. And so he said, we'll bring 15 of the top uh, lady cadets and gentlemen cadets. Um, and you can talk to them. And I said, I want to speak to them separately. Uh, and it was fascinating to get a sense from who they were, where they were recruited from, and, and why they came into the military, because now there were opportunities for them. Most of the women had come in uh, as lateral entries into senior positions or mid-level positions after taking professional degrees. Most of the young men had come in from the cities. And not one of the top 15 cadets that I spoke to at that particular course had actually had a, a relative or a family history of military service, which was very surprising for me. But that jibed with earlier data that um, I had and that Chris Fair and I produced an article on, uh, which indicated, among other things, that in the decade ending 2003, more officers were recruited in the Pakistan Army from Karachi than from my home district of Jhelum, which used to be the sword arm of the Pakistan army. So there's a shift take taking place. The military recognizes it. It recognizes the need to bring in women. Uh, it's a question of now expanding that recognition and helping the civilians uh, walk that talk so that it's not just talk. 
Uh, I promised a question to the gentleman in the back, and I'll put the former former foreign secretary on notice. I don't actually see you, sir, but he's still back here, right? Um, yes, he is. Oh, right over here. Okay. So I'll put you on notice, sir. If you want to question our American expert in a moment, you'll you'll have an opportunity next. But go Hi, ahead. My name is Tariq Zia. I'm a former Pakistani journalist. Very basic question, but I still want to ask, how do you see the future of the battle, the real battle, between civilian supremacy and the army establishment? It depends. It depends on how civil society, and particularly the business community, and the middle class in Pakistan joins this fight. I think it's very critical that it not be done as a negative issue, where you're trying to have supremacy of one over the other, but in a way in which you can construct a structure uh, that will allow everybody to profit from it. I think this is where parliament plays a huge role. The judiciary plays a huge role. Periodically it does, uh, but uh, if there are elements that are trying to control even the judiciary, then they have to be somehow corralled and, and brought into to check. Uh, I think that's very critical because an independent judiciary, uh, an independent media, uh, independent business community uh, can do wonders. Uh, Pakistan could be the next Singapore. Mr. Foreign Secretary, please take your turn. Do your worst, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for asking me to ask a question, <laughs> although I have read the book and I congratulate you. Uh, it's a very impressive work. Uh, I have a short comment and uh, maybe a couple of questions now that you have asked me. Uh, <laughs> uh, my comment is that uh, you said that you have not met any experts on Pakistan. Well, I have met many who said they were experts and I take it uh, as they said. I think I found that they were frustrated with Pakistan. And their frustration was that they looked at Pakistan as a mid-sized country, which did not behave the way it was expected to behave. The problem is that Pakistan is not a small country. It's a huge country, 220 million people. It is at the cross, uh, crossing points of uh, many fault lines, cultural, political, uh, strategic, etc. So it's a very complex country and uh, it doesn't sort of behave in accordance with the rationality of one scholar or one political <laughs> analyst. So this is uh, my comment and this applies to almost everything, even civil military relationship. For example, would the military want to rule Pakistan? In my view, it doesn't want to rule Pakistan. Whenever it ruled, it always had a civilian mask. After two years, three years, it had to have a civilian mask. And then when they left, there was a mess. So military, because of the, uh, uh, the, the complexion of Pakistan, with, they can rule Punjab, but they may not be able to rule the other provinces. So uh, let's not go into that. You mentioned about uh, uh, two things, two questions. You mentioned about uh, the new kind of uh, 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 cooperative arrangement with uh, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, etc. Um, having dealt with the so-called South-North Silk Route, which led to nowhere, the IPI, Iran, Pakistan, India pipeline, the Turkmenistan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline, one feels rather frustrated that all these ideas, good ideas, very potent ideas, they could not take off. Now under the present circumstances when the situation is such that even the basis for dialogue between India and Pakistan, that has been removed. Simla has become ineffective now. So how do you see that this is going to really, uh, really take off? The other question uh, is that uh, you have mentioned about uh, China 
United States, Pakistan, that uh, Pakistan doesn't want to make a choice between the two, and that is right. China also doesn't want Pakistan to make that choice. China has always been consistently saying that uh, uh, they want uh, uh, good relations between Pakistan and United States. But United States, which unlike China, there are multiple sources of signaling. You have the administration, you have the uh, Congress, you have the media, you have the academia, et cetera, et cetera. And there you get mixed signals. Now that China-US tensions, they are increasing, do you think they will push Pakistan to make a choice at any point of time? Thank you. Let me start with your last question, Riaz. You know more about this region than, than I could ever imagine myself learning. Um, but I don't think it is in Pakistan's interest to make that kind of a choice. And that is something that should inform Pakistan's thinking, even if people push it to, towards that direction. Uh, but then going back to, to the earlier point about expertise, uh, you, know, you and I both met, and there are people in this room who are expert on various aspects of the Pakistan-US relationship, or who are expert on Pakistan. I've interviewed many of the people that are sitting in this room because I value their expertise. Uh, and I, I do want to, to say something, which is that uh, today is a particularly sad day for those of us that work in Pakistan because we've lost a man who was the original expert on Pakistan, Steve Cohen, uh, who guided many of us who were uneducated or ill-educated about, about the region uh, and about the military particularly. And in my case, he was a great help and a mentor and a guide uh, when I did my first book, Cross Swords. Uh, th that kind of in-depth scholarship uh, is very difficult to pursue now. And there are some, uh, Dan Markey has left the room, but Dan and others are continuing to work on it. But it appalls me that in Washington today, when you look around, there are very few India or Pakistan experts or scholars that are available for that kind of broad, enlightening discussion. And we should be encouraging that more and more, uh, rather than reducing their ability to function. And part of the problem is that in both India and in Pakistan, there are so many restrictions on the ability of these scholars to operate and say the kind of things, because the right wing in both countries is now so ascendant that you know, if they don't like what you've written about the RSS, they will ban your books, your history books. Uh, they, will, they will burn them. And if they don't like what you've written about Pakistan, about the military or, or religion, um, the same fate will, will uh, befall your efforts. But my view is that these are long-term investments. And you were asking, what are the kinds of things that we could do? This is the kind of long-term investment. You have educational institutions work with each other, have cities work with each other, have uh, industrial groups work with each other, have the Congress of the United States work with the parliament in Pakistan and get to understand how they can assist them in setting up the equivalent of the Congressional Research Service, for instance, uh, and, and setting up uh, a secretariat for the National Security Council, uh, which is effective and independent. Uh, these are the kinds of things that can be done. So we shouldn't just be making decisions based on our gut, is that what mm, you're- Not at all, <laughs> okay. not at all. I want to invite, I think we've gone a little over time. I want to invite one more question. Is there one more person who has a brilliant concluding question? Uh, there's a guy who was there. I'm going to be biased. Is there a woman who wants to ask uh, one more question? I'm going to give you a question too, sir. Is there, is there, is there one more woman? Because we've had more men than women. Yes, go ahead, please stand up. Yeah, yeah, okay. you, yeah. Wait for the mic, please. I'm going to give you a question. Really, I am, sir. Sometimes it pays off to be a woman, I guess. Um, my name is Myra Khan. I'm an education specialist at the World Bank. And a while ago, I used to be an editor on, at the KP desk at the Express Tribune. Um, I have a question slightly similar to yours, um, which is you talk about, um, or you spoke about the need to include women in the workforce. And we're not talking 
just about the military, but what do you think is hindering women from joining the workforce? Is it a cultural thing? Is it a traditional thing? Is it a religious thing? And um, I also find it interesting that we haven't really talked about secularism or religion in sort of our discussion today. And so I kind of have two parts, a two part question. How much do you think a lack of secularism has led to many of the problems Pakistan has had? How much do you think um, sort of a more secular society in Pakistan would improve the conditions for it? Secularism is a term which is like a third rail in Pakistani politics. Uh, the reason being that it, it moves away from religion, moves you away, you become irreligious. People translate it as atheist almost. Exactly, yes. And so I wouldn't go that route at all. I think, uh, if anything, because the country has become very conservative and religious education has become quite <coughs> popular, particularly in the middle class, I think it would make a lot of sense to improve the study of religion inside Pakistan so that you actually understand what Islam offers uh, by way of equality of opportunity for women and what are the actual historical examples rather than the kind of caricatures that are presented by uh, the leadership, um, past and present, to the people of Pakistan. Um, I think self-interest will play a role and the middle class must play a role. Uh, you mentioned a host of different factors. All of them play a role. Society, uh, history, economic opportunities. Uh, if you actually look at the academic results in Pakistan, and, and you should know this because this is your area, and Momina should know it too. Um, if you look at the, the results of all the competitive examinations in Pakistan today, almost all the top positions are occupied by women. Very few men can compete with women when there is open academic competition. Yes, agreed, but they still don't succeed well, and that's really where the middle class has to come into play. And I think this is where the youth are going to have to claim that space. Because if half the population is below 23, that's the group that wants those jobs. And that can only be created when you have a larger economy. And, w and you can only create a larger economy if women are an active part of it. I think what I was saying was, you know, everyone wants the military to do everything in Pakistan. I don't want to fall into that category of saying that General Bajwa should now, instead of reading electric electricity meters for civilians uh, and ghost schools, he should now concentrate on educating women. What I'm saying is that an example has been set by different institutions. Uh, why can't that be popularized and propagated widely so that people see that it's perfectly OK uh, to do that? And, and a very good example of that, Steve, is in the software industry, where, in fact, the leader of, of PASHA, which is the Pakistan uh, Association of Software Developers, is, is a, a woman and has been for many years. Uh, the gentleman over here gets the final question. No, the guy who's, yeah, you yes. look behind for somebody else. But <laughs> you, Hi, my name is Luca, former Atlantic Council intern. Um, I was wondering if you could speak about how the evolving situation in Kashmir is affecting uh, Pakistan's relations with the US and also its standing in the world at the UN and, and beyond. This is still a very evolving situation. Um, and there's a, been an emotional response from the Prime Minister of Pakistan, which is rooted in his own, uh, his, his own beliefs and, and his sense of what Pakistan should uh, be doing and what the Muslim Ummah, the, the larger population of the Muslim world, should be doing. Uh, he hasn't exactly been met with a great deal of open support from within the, the Muslim world, uh, but he has managed to cobble together a small coalition uh, the issue really is, uh, where do the, my, this is my view, where do the Kashmiris come out in all of this? They've, they've been the ones that have been suffering. And uh, till their voices are heard, it doesn't matter what Pakistan says and what India says. And so I think the U.S. position has been to open up Kashmir, uh, to allow the voices to be heard, to remove the lockdown, 
And India is now reluctantly and slowly uh, trying to meet that demand. Uh, but till that happens, until they come up with a solution that they want, I think it's going to be very tough for Pakistan to say this is what we want for Kashmir. Because uh, if you go back to 1952, there was a secret letter that uh, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru wrote to Sheikh Abdullah. And I don't have the exact words, but I, I can send you the quote. Uh, it says, in effect, that you know we are so much bigger than Pakistan, it doesn't matter what Pakistan says. And accession is a done deal. Uh, nothing can change it. So if that is the position inside India, then only an internal debate, discussion, conflict between the Kashmiris and the Indian Union will resolve that. And Pakistan can be a, uh, can use moral suasion, but uh, Pakistan is not in a position, and it doesn't make sense for Pakistan to use threat of military intervention or force. Prime Minister Khan himself actually told the people of Kashmir that nobody should try and cross the border. I think that's a wise move. And I hope that over time, some of the discussions between India and Pakistan can resume, because till you have those discussions, you can't resolve issues. Please join me in thanking Shujan Wass. Thank you. Thank you.